So welcome to lecture 39 of MCS 471, an introduction into numerical analysis. So the lecture 39 uh, deals with hyperbolic partial differential equations. So we continue our very brief introduction into partial differential equations. And today we consider the wave equation. As before, we apply uh, the finite difference method. And in a way, it's a bit simpler than what we did last time, because we have twice uh, the partial derivatives and twice we apply the same central difference formula. So we arrive uh, at an explicit time stepping scheme. And there is still a complication. Um, so uh, starting the time stepping will require the application of a technique that we have seen before, uh, in particular when we did the two point boundary value problems with the Neumann conditions, when the derivatives were given, but not uh, the values. So we apply the same technique here. As, uh, Everywhere in this course, uh, the algorithms are defined by Julia functions. Uh, so, and we will run a Julia function to illustrate uh, the problem of stability. So the methods uh, that we derive are not unconditionally stable. So there is a condition on the step size. Uh, without that, if that condition is not satisfied, then our method will not converge. All right, then let's look at uh, the partial differential equations again, and uh, starting now with uh, the second example. So what is a partial differential equation? It's an equation in a function, in an unknown function, that is determined by partial derivatives. Uh, the second partial derivatives here appear with these constant coefficients a, b, and c. And the independent variables x and y, uh, together with the unknown function and the first partial derivatives, appear in the function capital F. We have these partial derivatives there in the independent variables x and y. Uh, the y, as is, was the case last time, uh, instead of y, we had a time as our second independent variable. So also here, uh, the wave equation will be a problem where the independent variable, one of the independent variables is time. So we are in the second case now, as we will illustrate, uh, we have uh, the discriminant b squared minus 4ac, and if that discriminant is positive, then the type of partial differential equation is hyperbolic. Or we can also, for this course, uh, we can simply say it is the wave equation. All right, what, how does a wave equation look now? Well, we have space, uh, a finite interval. Uh, going from A to B, and the second independent variable is time. So X lives in the interval, that's our first independent variable, and time is the second variable. In the last lecture, we had the diffusion constant. Here we have another constant, uh, the wave speed. So that's the constant C. Uh, one can think of uh, a string, a string attached, uh, fixed to both ends, and one is uh, plucking that string in the middle. Uh, so the uh, oscillation then of the string will follow uh, the, will obey these uh, second order differential equations. So note uh, that uh, this now looks again very much as an initial value problem. Um, and it's a, the difference with the parabolic equation 
is here that we have a second order equation in time. Uh, think about the pendulum a little bit. Um, so it's a second order equation in time. And you see we have two functions uh, given, uh, two functions that will tell for any point in the interval what is the position and what is the derivative, or otherwise what is the position and the velocity. So this is determined by functions f and g. So the first three equations uh, make this look like an initial value problem, but the last two equations make it look like also a boundary value problem. So we have two more functions, uh, the function L, which tells what is the behavior for all times at the left. Uh, sometimes that behavior is very uh, straightforward. If our string is fixed, then that function will be just zero. Uh, our string is fixed and does not go anywhere. And the other bound is then the other boundary condition is then given by the R. So four functions, one constant, um, and uh, the bounds. Um, so the time here is left unbounded, but for all practical purposes, we will also have a limit on the time. Uh, so there will, we will run the simulation for uh, we will run our computations for a fixed time interval. So I said that the uh, wave equation is hyperbolic. Um, we, we didn't do this uh, verification explicitly for uh, the um, parabolic equation or for the heat equation. But for the heat equation, uh, the constants, uh, so there was only one second partial derivatives that was different from zero. So we had that B and C were zero. So the discriminant uh, was actually naturally zero for the parabolic uh, heat equation, uh, or actually for the heat equation that made it parabolic. Um, so here we have two partial derivatives. Uh, the A and the C are uh, not zero. So in the standard format, uh, so forgetting all the boundary conditions and the initial conditions, then our wave equations can be very simply expressed as a two-term equation. So we identify uh, the one with C. So, and then we have the minus C square, which is the coefficient A. And there is no mixed partial derivative. The B is zero. And then we can indeed see that the, discriminate, uh, the discriminant evaluates to a positive number. So the wave equation fits the classification. OK, what does a solution to a wave equation look like now? Here is our running example. Uh, we have two variables. Um, so let me um, emphasize that we have the x going from 0 to 1, or rather the x doesn't go anywhere. The x is between 0 and 1. Uh, but the time goes here to from 0 to 1. So we have two independent variables. And then we have an initial wave. Uh, so when t is 0, you see we have the um, sine function, uh, the sine of pi x. Uh, that is our f of x. And all the other functions are 0. Um, so the initial velocity is 0. And the uh, left and bound conditions are also 0. And you see then how the wave evolves in time. Um, so like the uh, problem that we had, so this is a very good test problem again, because 
we know that if we have um, a string on a violin and we are not too wild with it, that uh, the string will not go anywhere very far out. Um, so we kind of know and we kind of hope that we also hope to experience the periodicity. Um, so we, we, we know already when the numbers will go out of control and in, in our first experiment they will, uh, that then something is wrong. Um, this is a little bit similar as with the heat equation where we had a decay, where everything had to go to zero. Here we hope that there is sufficient periodicity if we pick the wave speed correct and the wave speed is here too then we will expect at time equal one something that looks uh, very similar to the function we started with so this is the natural oscillation that would happen with the pendulum as well all right we have our equation we have the shape of our solution uh, so let's now see what is the code that produced uh, the picture on the previous uh, slide. So we will, we have uh, second partial derivatives and like we have already encountered with the boundary value problem. And we will again apply the finite, uh, the central difference formula like we did before. So uh, what does a numerical method do? A numerical method discretizes the continuous problem. So, and if the, uh, num if the step size is sufficiently small, then we can go as accurate as we like, or as accurate as our precision and our time will allow. So we have two step sizes. Uh, so H is again the constant that uh, is the step size in space and we have a second step size, the step size in time, which we denote again uh, by k. So h and k are uh, the distances between the points. The big N uh, and the big M, so M is a natural number that will be the dimension of the matrix that we are going to generate. And the big M is the number of steps that we are going to take. So here it is very convenient if we can start at zero. Um, so time is traditionally at zero and our intervals, the A and the B will be like in the example between zero and one. So that makes uh, the um, definition of H and K uh, a little bit easier. Um, but what the grid here shows that on this very particular example, the black dots are the dots where we know the values and the red dots are the unknowns. Um, okay. So, how does our, um, so then I should probably um, write down the very important definition here. We have the Y, uh, so we can still use the Y because uh, Y, we use T as the second independent variable. So we will have uh, the Y, which approximates the U at X I. and uh, the T J. So the second uh, index J uh, indexes the time variables. Um, so we have our unknown continuous function U and we will approximate the continuous function U by discrete points, applying the central difference formula. Uh, so we've applied this formula before. So this is uh, applied in space. Uh, so we twice the derivative uh, with respect to x and the t here is just a constant number. What is important is the h square. Uh, so here we have an equality sign. 
so this is equal if we find somewhere a point C1 for the value of X so that this matters, so that, that we have this equality. Now what matters is that uh, the error that we obtain will be quadratic in H, just as with the parabolic heat equation. Just as with the heat equation, that's parabolic. All right. Um, then we have the central difference formulas applied uh, to time. So here, uh, note the sub-index twice with respect to time. And the formula is just symmetric. Uh, we replace uh, H by K, and we now look into the second independent variable. What is important here is that because of this error term, we have the k square. And this is an important difference with what we did in the last lecture, where only the crank nicholson method was giving us this uh, same order, h square and k square. Here uh, we have that a local error uh, with the first idea uh, already gives us quite an accurate um, method. Uh, so if we want four decimal places correct, then our step size needs to be 1 over 100. So we need to compute 100 time steps uh, if we are in the interval 0, 1. So, um, I gave the definition of the y, uh, the, the discrete points. Um, we replace uh, the u's by the y's. Um, know that the i is for xi. So whenever we see, uh, and the j is for the um, time variable. So whenever we see t plus k, we write j plus 1. Whenever we see t, we write j. So um, what you can see in this formula here, we have the t k plus 1. Here we have the j plus 1. We have the t, t minus k. Here we have the j minus 1. So this is how this formula applies. Um, so the same then for uh, space, except now we have the, the J remains fixed. That's the formula. Um, so what else do we observe with this? Well, it is a time stepping formula. We start with time equals zero, and then we go to one. And what is uh, apparent here, and here I must use an other color, uh, what is apparent here is that there is only one term that involves j plus 1. So it looks as if at the first, po po at first sight, it looks like we are again in the situation like crank Nicholson, uh, but it actually is not. Um, so we will derive an explicit method. And here it is. Uh, so we have the equation where we do the regrouping of the terms. And we have again a sigma that's uh, creeping in. Uh, the sigma is used first as a abbreviation, as a way to write our equations shorter. But it will also be a very important character. Uh, so the sigma. Uh, stores the, the information that the sigma has. It has the information of the equation, the wave speed, the constant c. It has the step size in space, the h, and it has the step size in time. So the sigma is here actually a very important character. Uh, so let me point that out here. Uh, the sigma again, uh, we will occur, we, we, we will uh, in the third part of this lecture, this will become a very important character. For now, uh, we use this to abbreviate our um, 
equation, uh, our our equation, and you you can kind of see where the squares come in from, uh, and and why you, you may have wondered already why work with c square. Uh, well, here working with c square is actually now very useful uh, because uh, the k square and the h square also appear. So the the other all the three constants. Uh, so the k square, the c, and the h, they all appear with a power two. Um, so we can deal with then uh, the sigma square. Um, we we could have worked without the c square in the equation, but then somewhere we have square roots in the definition of sigma. Every discretization method for partial differential equations has a picture. Uh, it's called the stencil. So the stencil, um, the stencil uh, uh, is a picture of all the points that appear in the equation. So here the central point is IAJ. So we compute the next point, uh, the next point that is here for j plus one, we compute the next point from the previous three points. And, and from the point that is one step uh, before that. So uh, we have the, we compute the values for tomorrow from the values for today, and also using the value of yesterday. Fine set. Uh, but wait a second, what if you do this for j equals 1? And now I should probably go back, uh, change the, the coloring. So because we do have a problem here. Uh, the problem is that, uh, hey, we like to stay positive. But all of a sudden, if j equals 0, we have a negative index. Uh, and that's a problem. So we need... We, we first need to compute uh, j equals 1, and how are we going to do this if we need negative uh, values? All right, then. Uh, well, if j equals 0, then we are at the boundary. So the, the, these dots here for j equals 0, they will all be black. Uh, but what is the value for time negative 1? Can we go negative in time? We can't. But let's first um, delay this problem a little bit. Um, knowing actually that we can solve this problem, we have done it before when we did the boundary value problems with the Neumann conditions. Uh, we like to write our equations in full. Uh, so for all the variables, um, and uh, we arrive again at the tri-diagonal uh, matrix written here. Um, you can see in, this is a, a diagonally dominant uh, matrix. Uh, we see the two coming in here. And the sigma has one of the step sizes in its denominator. So the sigma uh, is, is, is typically, or, or so the, 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 the sigma might, might might also be uh, wait so the, the the h and the k may uh, I would, was about to say that the sigma could be very small, but that's not the case. But in in, in any case, you see that uh, the sigma on the diagonal appears twice. So this is already an indication that it will be diagonally dominant for any sigma if you take the uh, absolute values. All right, our time stepping formulas then. Um, so we have the matrix A. Uh, it's an explicit formula. So in each step, we do a matrix vector multiplication. Um, so the, the, it's, it's actually good to keep the stencil in mind. Uh, so we have the tri diagonal matrix. So that takes into account the three values of today, uh, so the three values of the current step. And then we have the uh, values from yesterday, uh, the values from j minus 1. 
And then we have the boundary conditions that are sitting in there. Um, so the boundary conditions are appearing when the I goes out of bound, or, or actually for the I equals one. So when the I equals one, we have a negative one sitting in there. So the I minus one, that's the multiplication with the sigma square. And we also have the I plus one. So when I equals M, we have the M plus one. Uh, and when I equals one, we have the I Y zero. And these two will not be a problem because we have the function f given. Uh, so for these boundary values, we will use f. But we also had a g. So the g will be used to solve our problem with the negative values for j. Um, and I actually misspoke. Um, so the f will not be used for uh, the uh, boundary values that are underlined, uh, but uh, the boundary values are the boundary values in space. So I was talking about i minus j, uh, but, but, but about the i coefficient. And uh, we have the right bound and the left bound. Um, so so the, the f and the g are used in the um, time stepping. So uh, the f in particular will be used uh, for the first uh, step. So the f will be used when j equals 1, then we will be using it in the first column. So when, when, when we have our first initial values. For the g, we will use the j minus 1 for the negative values. Um, so here is uh, the solution of our problem. So what's our problem again? Um, and here I explain uh, the technique uh, for uh, what we have used before with the two-point boundary value problems when we were working with Neumann conditions, where we needed negative values in our finite differences. And then we can apply central differences. Uh, so we are sitting at the point at the left bound here, at x naught. And we know y naught. And what is important too, we know uh, y prime. Uh, here this will be the g function. But let me uh, continue with recalling our technique from last time. We apply central differences. So here you see the central difference formula. One step forward, one step back. And that gives the difference of y1 forward and y negative 1. And we then use this to solve for y negative 1. So y negative 1, as you can see, is y1 plus 2 times, or actually here it will be a flip, yes, it will be a minus uh, 2 times h of the derivative. And we apply this id here, uh, but now uh, we work um, at uh, time equals zero, where here are actually we have the time equal st the step forward. So actually this is zero. Perhaps I m m should have uh, written this so very explicitly. So this is uh, zero plus k, and I'm muddling this up now. Let's try me doing this here. So here I have 0 minus k. So I'm doing this at uh, a equals 0. Actually, it is not a equals 0. It is a time equal 0. And what I said here, uh, when I was writing the formula for y negative 1, which is the uh, 
y1 minus 2 times h is also here. Uh, but now, uh, instead of h, I have k. And instead of the y prime, I have the g. And the g uh, was the initial velocity given in our uh, formulation of the wave equation. So that gives us the value needed to start. Um, all right, then we have our method. Um, so these are then the time stepping uh, formulas. So we have a specific formula to start uh, at the very beginning. Um, so the formulas that we had earlier were in general when j is larger than uh, one. Here we have the formulas uh, where we compute uh, the values for j equals one. So we are currently at j equals zero and we compute the value for one. And um, just to emphasize what we derived last time on the previous slide uh, is uh, used here. So the general formula uh, can now be applied explicitly. Note that uh, what I actually wanted to indicate, what was in red in the preparation here, is that at first it looks an implicit method. We have y i comma one at the left and y i comma one at the right. But if you bring it to the left, we have two times i y i comma one, and we divide by zero uh, by two. I'm sorry. So we divide by two, and then we get our explicit uh, method that we can now apply to compute our very first uh, values. Right, so, okay, so this method uh, took a long time to start up. Um, so we are ha half hour in in this lecture. We have computed the first row of values um, with this explicit method. So using, uh, so perhaps I can now, so the, the G's are in here, uh, but we also have now uh, the values that we will need uh, for uh, the time equals zero. So these are the initial, initial positions that we will having. So the, 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 the values at time equals zero that we know already. So what is in, uh, so our point is all also out in the uh, uh, code, uh, but what you see here, everything at the right is known. We have our tri-diagonal matrix A. We have the values that are given at the boundary by the left bound and the right bound. And we have the G's that are very explicit. What is probably not so explicit here is that all these values for time equals zero, so that was given by the fx. So the fxi, so that will be the y i comma zero. So this is uh, important here to note. Otherwise, we couldn't really start either. So we have used all the information that is in the wave equation, the left bound, the right bound, the F and the G, and uh, the sigma also incorporates the C. Time for some computations. Um, we have a Julia function, a Julia function that is defined by the wave constant, the initial position function, the F naught, the initial velocity function, the G naught, and then the left bound values and the right bound values given by the functions here, LB and right B, RB. Uh, then the uh, 
constraints on the intervals. Uh, so the constraint on the left bound and the right bound, A and B, and the time interval from zero to T, to capital T, the big T. The two important parameters uh, that determine how much work we want to do are the capital M and the capital N. So the big M tells the spacing, will define the spacing for, uh, will define the H, and uh, the, the big N will uh, determine the K. Um, so here it's, for this example here, uh, we have that uh, we will run this initially, if we don't know anything better, uh, for M equal 20, the N, the big N is 50. So this code is self-contained. So the example code, uh, you can just copy and paste into a cell of a Jupyter notebook or use it in a Julia program. And our method is quite simple, uh, or I would perhaps also say that Julia is quite, has a very expressive power. So everything fits on one slide. Uh, although I had to use the semicolon, um, the semicolon is used here to define our important characters. Um, so the H, the K, and the sigma. Um, so it's a little bit, um, um, how would I say this? So we have the division by the M and division by the N. So it uh, appears that we have some inconsistencies uh, with the previous slides. But note here that uh, we start at one in Julia. Every array starts at one. Um, so it would have been more convenient, especially for time, if we started at zero. Um, but here our first uh, result will be for time equals zero. That's why we divide by n minus one for the step size. So you can see how this gets initialized. Uh, so here, perhaps the, an, an, another color for the initialization. Um, so we initialize at time equals zero. We use our function f naught. So the result is a matrix. Uh, so we will use this matrix in the plot. Um, if we wanted to be more frugal with the memory, uh, the plotting would be defined inside this function as well, which would make it a little bit more cumbersome. So we don't do this here. Uh, so the important uh, formula is uh, the multiplication with A and the uh, subtractions of the day of the values of yesterday. And then we have the side conditions. Uh, the side conditions defined here bar these this offset array um, i should also have probably pointed out uh, that the formula for j equal one what we called the special formula for j equal one is what i um i am uh squaring unboxing in like now and this uses the uh, the initial velocities. So the initial velocities are used in the first time. And this is where we also divide by two. So you see the 0 0.5 uh, getting in all the time. Okay, um, so this is our function. Let's see how it runs now. Um, so I still have 10 minutes left. Uh, that should be enough to solve another problem. And here you see what the problem is. Um, if we run this, and for lack of better values, we used n equals 50, but that's actually not good. So you see, when we look at the numbers, and we were uh, just taking a violin string and uh, having a very gentle uh, design function is quite nice. Uh, we just had uh, this simple start, but you see that the violin actually, the violin string completely swings out of control. Um, 
So it oscillates here too. So you see we have four times 10 to the power six minus eight times 10 to the power six. So huge, huge oscillations. So our string is scratched uh, beyond imagination. So our numerical method is completely wrong, um, which is not true. Uh, so actually I should have said that we didn't do this for n equals 50. We did it for n equals 25. Um, so for 50, it will be fine. So that was the example. For 50, it will be fine. If you want to be faster or doing less work for n equals 25, it's not good. Um, so there is a condition on the um, step sizes like we had with the heat equation. But first, let's play with this a little bit. Uh, so 50 is okay, 25 is not. Uh, determine experimentally by running the function for values, say you try 35. If 35 is okay, you try a little bit less. Uh, you try uh, until you have confidence in the numbers. Uh, eventually, it would be good also to make a plot. Um, so the, 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 the value is taken for 50 in order to have a nice plot, so the nice plot in the beginning. Uh, you, if you take the values of n less, you will have uh, plots that are less smooth, but that are still plausible. Um, Plotting for n equals 20 will not look like a good plot, although it's interesting to look at. All right, uh, how did this happen? Well, uh, something new here, uh, we are doing matrix vector multiplications. Um, so the matrix vector multiplication is a little bit more complicated because we use the values of yesterday. Day, the, the earlier uh, values. So in the in the rewriting, we have uh, a matrix that involves the identity matrix. So we have to, in our matrix multiplication, we have to consider two different vectors: the next vector and the current vector at the left, the y j plus one and the yj, so the next vector and the previous vector at the left. At the right, we have the current vector and the previous vector. Uh, the side conditions, the offset doesn't really matter. So we can also now frame it as an eigenvalue problem with the spectral radius. Um, and we can compute this. Uh, so we have the matrix, we have the, the definitions. We can enlarge this matrix with the identity matrix. And now we see that uh, we have eigenvalues that are too large. Uh, the eigenvalue is 10. So it's not 1. W one, one would still be have been good. But here, uh, note again that, as always, uh, we read our numbers backwards. So we have 10. Uh, and 10 as spectral radius means that in the power method, your uh, your vectors actually uh, grow and grow and grow. For the power method, we always rescale. No problem there. Uh, but here we do not really rescale the, the the numbers. It wouldn't make sense anymore. So that's where we see the, the divergence. We have a theorem. Uh, it's called uh, the theorem uh, that will give us an interpretation of the sigma. The sigma is called uh, the CFL number, uh, named after uh, the discoverers of this theorem. Uh, so this theorem proving it is not uh, in scope of this course. Uh, but what is important is that we can interpret and we can apply this theorem. So this theorem will give us conditions on the step sizes. Um, so uh, we kind of see, and also the previous exercise, you can actually now solve uh, analytically without doing any runs, essentially. So you, you will see that um, 20 over 50 is fine. Um, 
and you could have gone a little bit less. So 40 and 41 uh, would have been the critical values if you picked uh, the big M to be 20. So these are the back of the envelope computations that one can do very quickly to determine the most important parameters, the most important numerical parameters in our Julia function. All right, um, how do we apply this now? Um, so uh, we essentially did this already. Um, but this is for speed uh, two. And in, in some sense, this exercise is already solved. Uh, N equals uh, 40 will most likely do it, 41 perhaps better. Uh, but verify this also experimentally. Here is another application. Uh, so uh, what if the wave runs uh, three times as fast? Uh, here you see a picture that appears correct. So uh, you, you could also interpret this as uh, moving your time interval from one to three. So that would have given the same picture. Uh, with wave speed equal to 2. So here is the last uh, slide, and let me emphasize immediately uh, the punchline. If the wave travels three times as fast, uh, so C, the constant, uh, becomes 6, then uh, correspondingly, we have to decrease uh, the step size in time. Uh, that is uh, equivalent to taking three times as many um, time steps. So, as I said, equivalently, it's like we are stretching the time interval of our uh, simulation with the original speed. Okay, that's it. So this was the next to last lecture on partial differential equations. Uh, next time we will consider the third type of equation, the steady state equation.